Uh, yeah, thanks to TPSA and the MassDoc for the invitation to talk. Um, and um, so, what I want to talk about is a theory of everything. This is my very grand title, and then very small font because that's really what I'm going to talk about. A theory of everything into the law. And even that, I'm not really going to tell you about. It's a bit of a lie, like nearly all uh, titles. Um, and the proposal for the theory of everything, integrable, is uh, self dual Yang Mills. Um, so I'm going to try, roughly speaking, to give some idea of like what an integrable system is, what Yang Mills is, what self dual means, um, why the two are connected, and why self dual Yang Mills is a theory of everything integrable. Um, and I'm kind of going to do it in a historical sort of path, so I'm going to sort of roughly give some idea of how these things. Now, both of these are rather technical things, they involve lots of different things, and so obviously I'm going to be very, very sketchy, um, and slightly impressionist. Um, but I do hope to at least to try and convince you at the end, or try to explain to you sort of how these things are connected, and also a little bit, just so you have some idea of what they are. Okay. So, now in some sense, I think everybody has some idea of what sort of integrable means. And sort of the usual thing, especially when we think of systems with like finite numbers of degrees of freedom, um, that what you need is you need the number of conserved quantities to be equal to or more than the number of degrees of freedom. And so, like, sort of the simplest example is the, is the well known sort of two body problem, right? So, I have um, two bodies interacting via some potential um, and, you know, in three dimensions, right? So I'm in, I'm in three dimensions. And so here, each particle has three degrees of freedom, right? It's positions. Um, so there's a total of six degrees of freedom. So I have six degrees of freedom. Um, and I have seven, uh, seven conserved quantities. So seven conserved quantities. And the conserved quantities are usual ones. Like the energy is going to be conserved. Um, the, the system is, is, is translation invariant, right? So it has conservation of, of, of total momentum, and it has conservation of angular momentum, right? Because the potential is central. So I have I have three, three momenta, three angular momenta, and energy. So that's my seven conserved quantities. Uh, and so you can see um, that uh, you know, I have more conserved quantities than I have degrees of freedom. And so this system is, is integral, and you've probably all seen this, you've all solved Kepler's problem, and yeah, you know, the motion is generally, you know, it can be complicated, but it's, it's regular in, 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 you know, in large part. Um, and, uh, and in particular, you know, like if, if you change it a little bit, like if you, if you change the initial velocity a little bit, or you change the initial starting point a little bit, the motion is, you know, it's basically the same. So it's kind of stable under small perturbation. Um, so, so this is sort of an example of integral. Okay. Now, that's very, very topical, and, or whatever everyone's seen on Netflix. Um, or you can watch the 50-episode version on Chinese television, which is kind of actually kind of better in some ways. Production values are not, <laughs> not actually as high, but it's, it's, anyway, okay, whatever. The three-body problem, right? So now, now I have nine degrees of freedom. Um, I still only have seven conserved quantities, and so this system is famously chaotic, right? And so, uh, um, in, in particular, so the motion is, uh, you know, has there's a much wider range of motion. The, 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 the things will sort of explore all of phase space, all possible points of position and momenta. And secondly, you know, if you make a small change of the initial conditions, you get something very different. So those are sort of two ways of sort of characterizing a chaotic system. And, and this can kind of be generalized um, in, uh, in, in, so if I have a Hamiltonian system, so a Hamiltonian system is one where the motion is given by um, some functional of the momenta and position. And here you can think of now, say, I have like, you know, n bodies, right? So I could have uh, i going from one to n. Um, and so if, if my time evolution, so here um, sort of I have some function of p's and q's, and I want to calculate how the thing changes under time, it's given by a quantity called the Poisson bracket. So this 
this this thing here is, is the Poisson bracket, um, and um, I'm not really going to define it. It's not something I'm going to need, but you can kind of think it's it sort of um, it's anti-symmetric. So if I exchange the positions, it's, it's uh, I get a minus sign. It's linear in the two quantities, um, and it probably has a couple of other properties that define it. But in any case, um, yeah, I need to calculate this sort of gadget called the Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian goes in there and then this tells me how the thing changes in time. And so in particular, if this quantity F commutes, Poisson commutes, which just basically means this bracket is zero. If this is zero, this tells me that this quantity F is a conserved quantity. And you have this notion of uh, Louisville integrability. Spell, where if I have some n-dimensional system, so I have qi i going from 1 to n, if I have uh, n, conser n conserved charges, so that means I have fi going from 1 to n, such that fi Poisson commutes with my Hamiltonian, and they are in, in involution, so they have to Poisson commute with each other. Then the motion is, is integrable and has all these nice properties. It, it doesn't go everywhere, it doesn't explore all possible regions of phase space. It actually stays on a nice torus in phase space. So it's all very regular. So, so this gives you sort of quite, you know, a very and there's a, there's a little bit more technical stuff you have to throw in, but this gives you quite a rigorous definition of what an integrable system is for a finite dimensional system. And super great, that's sort of done, and that's not what I want to talk about. Okay. <laughs> so the question here is, is that, okay, great, what, what happens now if I want to go to a field theory? So consider field theory. And so by a field theory, I mean a system which is described by um, some function um, of time. So obviously here, you know, my positions uh, <laughs> y were functions of time. But now I want to consider something that is a function of, of, of position as well, x. So you can think of x as being some one-dimensional position. That's what we'll think about in a minute. Um, and, and of course, label, this label x uh, is, you know, it's, it's continuous, so here I have some discrete label. You could kind of imagine, you know, allowing this, you know, n to become infinite and sort of be countable. But here, more than that, you know, this is this is a, going to be a continuous variable, and so it's 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 not countable. So I have sort of an infinite number, uh, sort of 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 particle positions, but sort of an uncountable uh, an uncountable set. Okay, so so a field theory is is a theory labeled by 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 this, and and. The, sort of the question is, is that, okay, is there a similar notion of integrability for such infinite dimensional systems as I have for finite dimensional systems? And the answer is no, there's nothing, there's nothing like this nice. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about sort of what we have, but actually in some sense, that's kind of an important question. Like, can we generalize this notion of integrability to infinite dimensional systems? Now, you probably don't need just a sort of a motivation for why an infinite dimensional system, um, uh, infinite dimensional systems are important, um, but uh, there is sort of one important example. Well, okay, it's an important example in the history of integral models, um, and I guess it's a practical matter. It's also kind of uh, uh, important, and that is the motion of long waves in narrow channels. So I have. Um, I'm going to have some, some narrow channel, and I have some wave um, moving. So this is, this is the direction x, and you know, time is just describing how things move in time. And, and I'm going to sort of think of the wave as being much longer than my, um, my channel. So in, in that sense, it's sort of just you can think of it as a straight line. And so even though sort of, you know, waves on water are really sort of you think of this two-dimensional system, here, I kind of can reduce it just there's just one variable that tells me sort of where where the wave is and by where the wave is sort of u of x this thing here is going to be sort of the the height of the wave the amplitude of the wave how high the wave is above its equilibrium position so we can think um so important example is uh, long waves in shallow 
channels where water displacement above equilibrium is related to U of xt. Okay, there's a whole bunch of weasel words in there, related and all sorts of things like this. But roughly speaking, you can kind of you can think of it as that way, right? So U U tells me how high the water is above its sort of resting level. Um, and then we want to, you know, we want to find well, how does that, how does that, you know, wave behave um, as as a function of time, or what are the possible ways? Okay, so so this was, you know, as you can kind of imagine, this is quite a practical problem, and so people had studied it going back to like you know, 16th century, um, and they had derived a partial differential equation that described how these waves behave, and so there was uh, so a mathematical model. for such uh, a system is is this equation. So what I mean here is, so this subscript, so u of t means I take the time partial derivative of my function u. I'm also going to sort of sometimes write this as yeah, partial or del subscript t times u. So I, I do have a fair bit of notation. Um, so, but you know, this all of these things are just the partial derivatives of these functions. And and this thing here, u x x x. So you can kind of guess what u of x is. U of x would just be the partial derivative of u with respect to the variable x. And then when I put multiple ones in, I just mean taking the third. Uh, so it's just this. Right? So I take the, the third derivative, third partial derivative with respect to the variable x. Okay. So like this kind of equation, you've probably seen things like it. I mean, you know, sort of you've seen probably the heat equation where you have one time derivative and two x's. You've seen the wave equation where you've got two t's and two x's. So it, you know, it, it's not. It's a little bit strange that you have three, you know, three partial derivatives with respect to x. But it's you know, it's sort of kind of not so shocking. And and. and Kind of unsurprisingly, it actually does have um, uh, it has it has sort of oscillating solutions, the kind of wave solutions that you see in you know like in the wave equation. So, for example, you can there's a solution that looks like the following. Um, so, a cosine square root c x plus c t. Uh, Plus d. Okay, and you know some of this doesn't matter too much. A is 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 basically is going to be the amplitude of your wave, right? So it's the the the, the height, the maximum height of your wave. Um, C is the speed of your wave. You can kind of see that it's a function of x plus c t. So c is the is the speed. It tells you how you know the, how it moves. And d is is obviously it's just another constant. Okay. And this was a pretty good model. I mean, you know, you, this is the thing. It's like Waves in channels, you can go out and look at them and, and ask them, do they behave like this? And, and actually, a lot of them um, do behave exactly like this, right? So, and so this was this was a pretty good model. And then in uh, 1834, there was um, a Scottish civil engineer uh, named Russell, uh, and Russell again is quite in a sort of like many of these 18th century uh, characters, so he was a Scottish uh, engineer. You know, he um, so he, he did some of this, you know, sort of looking at waves. So he was also a naval architect um, and a shipbuilder, and you know, had this sort of wild career of being an experimental physicist and also sort of building ships, sort of you know, being able to move. The connection between sort of research and you know enterprise was sort of maybe closer in those days as well. Um, you know, yeah, anyway, okay. Mm. So he was near um, the, the Union Canal near Edinburgh, and there was a sort of a boat that was moving, and uh, it stopped. And, you know, the, obviously, there's a, the way the water builds up in front of the boat, and the boat stopped, and the wave continued. And he noticed it, and he, he noticed that this, this wave was sort of moving along, sort of just by itself, uh, and, and kept going. 
And so he was on horseback, and so he chased after the wave. As you do. And so, and he noticed that it really went, went for about eight kilometers or something like this. Um, and finally, it sort of exited the, the, the canal and into the and so and then and then he couldn't follow it anymore. Um, and so he was fascinated by this. So he went home and built himself sort of canals and sort of, and, and started doing experiments and sort of, you know looking at how the water behaved and, and, and sort of thing. And one of the things that he noticed is that this this was not this was not a good model. I mean, he, because this doesn't describe a solitary wave sort of moving. And even a little bit more concretely, the wave that he found had the fact that the speed was related to the amplitude. So he uh, noted a solitary wave moving um, with an amplitude proportional to its speed. And you can't get waves like this from this, and so it's just wrong. But people were like, well, no, you, you must have solved ghosts or whatever. It can't be true. This was, this was you know, um, but he was persistent and he kept asking. Now, but still, you know, it was a real controversy. It was an example of where, you know, experimental results, observations um, contradicted. Theory and so theory had to be wrong and you know in some sense that's kind of almost like the platonic ideal of how science is supposed to work. Um, obviously, usually with less horses, but still. Um, <laughs> yeah. So okay. So but it took a while actually. Yeah, you know, and, and you can really look at you know who worked on this and it is like a who's who of um, 19th century British theoretical physics like Airy and Stokes and uh, um, Raleigh and um, and it was about the, so the 1870s, um, uh, a physicist named Usenek, I have to get this wrong, Usenek, I'm also probably mispronouncing it. Um, he built a mathematical model um, uh, which to try and you know, sort of describe this, this, this phenomena. Um, and then Raleigh was familiar with it. And like everything, if you're the first person to discover something, it doesn't get named for you. And it gets named this name for the second person who discovered it. Um, and sometimes it gets discovered for your supervisor. Um, um, so, so as I say, Raleigh and uh, worked on it. And then um, in 1895, uh, Courtweg and De Vries. And so supervisor, a PhD student, um, built the model, um, and they essentially reproduced the results um, that had been found previously. I and mean, they did an awful lot of sort of extra work and analysis, and I mean, I'm being slightly flippant. Um, but the thing is, is that it, it is now called the KDV equation. So, so the KDV equation is the following. So they, they found sort of a modification of this thing where you include an extra term. Oh, and I, sorry. It, 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 the sign doesn't actually matter. You can you can always change the sign by say sending t to minus t. Um, but it's, yeah, so okay. But just to be consistent in my notes. Okay, so so they, this was the equation that they came up with, and you can see it's basically the same, except it has this extra term, right? And this extra term, it's nonlinear because it's you can see it has two powers of of sort of u, right? Of u and ux. And that makes just an enormous difference. Like these equations, you sort of thought how to solve in, in, in class. This one, you're essentially never thought how to solve um, because it's, it's usually it's just impossible. Um, but uh, so yes, that's true. Now the other thing is you can kind of see why this one actually kind of worked well because if u is kind of small and u of x is also kind of small, so if you're looking at small waves, then this term is going to be kind of small. Um, so that's why that kind of worked a lot. But if you look at big waves, then this nonlinearity becomes very, very important. And this, this equation does have uh, it, it, so generally when you have a nonlinear equation, you cannot solve it. Um, but this one, even back then, they were able to write down what the solution was. And so there is there is a solution. Um, and it's the following form. Oh, I think I've got the same thing. 
no limit notion. Okay, so it looks like this. So like, in some ways, it's not like, you know, it has, well, hyperbolic functions rather than trigonometric functions, but you know, it kind of, and then there's, there's, there's some scalings of T. I could rescale, I probably should have rescaled T. Um, so in any case, but you can see that uh, the speed, so the speed here is 4C, is proportional to the amplitude. So this this does some, you know is a is a better mathematical model of, of, of observation. So it kind of stood there for for a while, and, and uh, it wasn't until then the 1960s. In the, so jumping forward, so in the 1960s, um, you know, people, so in this case, uh, sort of mathematicians or applied mathematicians, Green and Morikawa, were looking at um, a different physical problem, basically, also in hydrodynamics. They were looking at collisionless waves and hydrodynamics, and they ended up just they ended up sort of coming up with the same equation. And of course, this is one thing you know. Sort of, if you look at any physical system, you get the harmonic oscillator. Um, if you you know, I mean, that's not true, but to a good approximation, an amazing approximation, it's actually true. And and that's often the way, right? You look at different physical systems, and the same equations keep popping up. Um, so they, they found they, they found the KDV equation. Uh, and but but in this case, um, they. And then also with um, uh, Gardner, Green, and Mura, they took to so actually in this this is sorry what have I done? That should be Gardner, Green, Mura. What have I missed? Oh, Kruskal. Okay, um, so yeah, so, so, so these, these authors then sort of tried to set about like actually trying to find solutions to it more generally. And they were interested in not just, so this here kind of describes a single solitary wave sort of moving, but they were interested in finding collisions between, um, between such things, right? So, so this describes sort of a single solitary wave moving along, and they wanted to find what happens when you sort of move two of them through each other. And in particular, so that they shouldn't, so they should pass through each other kind of without anything happening. So that this sort of collisionless behavior. Okay. Um, and so they were trying to do this, and they noticed that this equation is in some sense an infinite dimensional version of these finite dimensional integrable systems, in that it, it is integrable in a certain sense. And so by that I mean the following. So they noted. V uh, is completely integral, although question marks or quotation marks. So um, by that, what do I mean? So they notice that this system here has an infinite number of conserved quantities. So what you know, I, I kind of said before what I meant by a conserved quantity in the context of um, of a Hamiltonian system, and here I, I mean I could do that in terms of a Hamiltonian system, um, but I, I'm going to give a slightly related but different definition. So by a conserved quantity in this case, I mean something such that the partial derivative of d uh, with respect to time is uh, related to the partial derivative. Of a different quantity j with respect to x. So this is this is the uh, uh, conservation equation, um, and you can see that this equation tells me that d is a conserved quantity. In particular, if I compute the integral of d um, with respect to x from a to b, I can you know I'm, so I'm basically integrating this equation. I can integrate this term here, but because it's a derivative with respect to x, 
this is a total derivative. So doing the integration with respect to x, this is just jb minus ja. Right? I just evaluate this quantity j at the endpoints. Okay? So, so this integral is kind of trivial. And then if this thing vanishes, so if ja equals to jb equals to 0, then you can see that this thing here, let me call it q, has vanishing time derivative. Right? So if these vanish at the endpoints, then this integral here has time derivative equal to zero and is a conserved quantity. So basically, anytime I kind of find an equation like this, and I say that the thing vanishes at the endpoints, then I have a conserved quantity. And actually, this equation here is already sort of, you can kind of see that it, it already is a conservation equation. <coughs> so obviously here I have like the time derivative of, you know, so if I take d0 equal to u, so now I have dt of u, and I can actually write this as plus the derivative with respect to x, of that minus 3u squared minus uxx. So, so this equation tells me that u is a conserved quantity. Okay, so that's not so surprising. And actually, you, you can also tell that this thing, if I take the derivative of u with respect to x, I can just take the derivative with respect to x, derivative, and you'll actually be able to check, well, with a little bit of work, but this one is also conserved. But and so in some sense, that's not so surprising. But what uh, these authors were able to find, actually in particular the last one through a kind of a neat trick, is that they were able to find a second one, or uh, T2, um, that is uh, nonlinear. So in this case, it's like u x x, I think sorry, plus 1 sixth u squared, something like this. <clears throat> so this conserved chart, this is also conserved. And now you can see it's starting to get sort of nonlinear, so it involves higher powers of u. And in fact, you can keep going. You can look at things that involve more and more higher powers of u, and you'll, you'll be able to find a sort of an infinite number of conserved charges. So it goes higher and higher orders. So this was a sign that this system is very, very special, and that it's integrable, that it has, or that, you know, but is it, because here I have some sort of countable number of charges, but here I have some infinite number of degrees of freedom, so I have two infinities, but they're not really the same, and so it's very hard to, you know, and, and of course this is sort of fundamentally this issue with going to the, 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 the um, continuous system. So I do have an infinite number of conserved quantities, and I have infinite number of degrees of freedom, but is it really integrable in the same way? So, so is there something else? And, and I'm, in fact, the same authors were actually able to find um, an even more kind of important property of this equation, which is that it has, you, you can write this, this equation, this KDV equation, in a different way. So I can introduce uh, a differential operator L acting on some function psi, where L is, oh no, sorry, I want to say lambda. So yeah, so I introduced this, this thing L, which, which is here, so it's the second derivative with respect to x, there's some potential, and um, I'm going to say it satisfies this equation with some variable uh, lambda, right? Some parameter lambda. And then I can introduce another, um, <laughs> another operator m, that is dt, this one a bit more complicated, The specifics actually really do matter. Like these numbers uh, are very, very important, but obviously in this particular context, um, you know, can't check. 
So, so I, but I have these two things, and I'm going to say that these two equations are, are, are going to be uh, satisfied. And I want to say that the two of them are satisfied at the same time. Right? So they have to be simultaneously satisfied. So for these equations to be compatible, I need that these two things commute, right? So here I could kind of I could take I could um, am I doing this right? Yeah. Um, so I could take this and I could act on it with uh, with L, and I should get zero. Um, or correspondingly, I could act with M here, and of course now this should be this should be zero. And so these two things should need to be the same. And in order for this sort of these equations to be consistent, this tells me. You know, for any uh, for any function here, that these objects have to commute. So I have this for these equations to be compatible, to be simultaneously, uh, you know, allowed. This has to be true. So you can take this, and you can, you know, so and here by the, this just means, right? So like just the order doesn't matter. I can calculate this thing, and you find that this is true when this is true, and this. Is this means that this equation has uh, what's now called a lax representation. And again, th th this might seem, oh, that's sort of a technical trick or, or whatever. Like, oh, that's, but, but what does it, what does it get? Well, you know, what do I gain from this? And so the story kind of goes that they were in their office uh, <laughs> staring at this equation, and they, they, had this, they had this equation written on the blackboard. Um, and somebody was walking by the hallway, and they said, oh, look, you're looking at the Schrodinger equation. Um, and it's true. I mean, if you've seen the Schrodinger equation, you maybe you know, you've probably seen this sort of h bar squared over two m nabla squared uh, plus v, you know, r this sort of thing, right? Um, psi is equal to the energy times psi. So this is the sort of usual way we write Schrodinger equation. But like. You know, the, the numbers don't, I can, these don't matter too much. And, but here I do have some potential. Um, and, and here I have some, I have an energy. So th this equation really is the Schrodinger equation. And so this, um, this gave them an idea for how to solve it. Like the, 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 the U looks like um, the potential, right? So, well, if I have the Schrodinger equation, well, what's the first thing you do? The first thing you do is you start calculating, well, what are my allowed energies, right? Um, that, that's often, that's the thing you're interested in solving. So here, oh, what are my allowed lambdas? And then, then you ask, well, what are my wave functions for my Schrodinger equations? And you go, oh, well, what are my, what are my wave functions? And you can calculate those things. And then this equation here, this one, this tells you how everything evolves in time, right? How you're, so, you know, so you can now, you're now looking at um, wave functions. If you find them at some particular time, you can find them at some later time. Okay, so that's so I, I can you know given my, given some u, I can calculate the spectrum of energies and calculate my wave functions, and I can find how they evolve in time. And then there's a funny thing which we probably haven't seen in class, but if you think about it, it's true. If I tell you what the spectrum of energies are, and I tell you what the wave functions are, you can reconstruct what the potential is, right? This is the inverse problem, right? So normally we kind of go in one way, you get the potential, and you'll go, oh, what's the energy? But you can go the other way. I mean, there's conditions of when you can do that and so on, but you know, it's, it can be specified as a well-specified problem. So, so if, I, if I calculate my energies and my wave functions at some later time, I can then ask, well, what's my potential at some later time? But that's, that's the U that I'm looking for, right? That's what I wanted to find all along. And so this is called the inverse scattering method. Um, and, and, and indeed, the, you know, you can convert those sort of hand-waving statements into actual concrete equations, and you can do it. And you can find solutions to this equation, to this nonlinear equation, and you can find this solitary wave solution that I found. That one's sort of actually relatively straightforward. But then you can find, so you can find two of these solitary waves sort of scattering into each other. And, and actually, it's very nice. They, they sort of they scatter into each other. They sort of pause very slightly, and then they move on. And when they move on, they're unchanged. They have exactly the same profile. So in that sense, they're sort of collisionless. But that pause is um, sort of what happens in the scattering, the, the sort of time delay. Um, and so, OK, so that was great. So, so you know, this inverse scattering method can be used to solve, to solve this. Uh, this integrable equation. 
And in fact, this, this then led to a huge range of work. There's lots and lots of integrable models. There's the sine gordon theory. There's um, nonlinear Schrodinger. Um, and this inverse scattering method could be generalized in many, many different directions, including to quantum systems. Um, and really, there's been like 50 years of, of work. And it, it, it's sort of like an evergreen, an evergreen subject. But it's also true that most of the time that people have studied this, it really is kind of like, you know, you look at the, um, you look at the KTV equation, or you look at the sine gordon equation, it really is sort of equation by equation. And, you know, the inverse scattering method holds for many integral models, but doesn't hold for all. Um, this lax representation holds for many integral models, but doesn't hold for all. It, this infinite conserved charges holds for many, but it doesn't hold for all. And, and so it's like, is there really, what does it mean for a model to be integrable? Is there a definition <coughs> of, of integrability for such infinite dimensional systems? And to be honest, today there still isn't. Um, there's, there's no one definition. There's, there's lots, to say, some of the ones I've mentioned. Another one is this, okay, called pan Leve property, which has to do with the singularity, the singularities of the solutions. Um, but but it's, it really is still kind of an open question. Okay, so, uh, so that's what integral models are and um, sort of kind of how they occurred. Um, and one nice thing about this is that, so here I've kind of introduced one as like in an actual physical context. Most of the time that's not true actually, because nature is rarely sort of simple, especially when you're looking at water waves and so on like that. Um, and so often integral models are not good descriptions of particular physical systems, but they, what they can be, but because you can solve them, you can often hope to learn something about a simple model, and those insights can then be generalized to more complicated systems. So that's sort of one of the general, but also they're beautiful, they have lots of structure, and that's often another reason for wanting to. <coughs> okay, so that's, that's this bit, and now I want to talk about this bit. Um, so, but to do that, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, electromagnetism. So, Maxwell's thing. So, Probably everybody knows about electromagnetism. I'm not really going to say too much about it. Um, and we're not really going to need too much about it. But some of it is just, again, a little bit of notation. So Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, the usual things you have. You have a scalar potential um, and you have a vector potential, right? So you see these, you know, uh, in electrostatics and magnetostatics. Um, so for, I can sort of combine my uh, scalar potential and my vector potential. So there's three components of the vector, and there's one scalar, and I can combine these into four things. So here, mu labels the four objects. So mu is either 0, 1, 2, or 3. Um, and it labels the four objects. As I say, there's three objects here, labeled by 1, 2, and 3. And I call this 0. This is, yeah, OK. So, um, and, and each of these things, so every object here, um, so a mu, each one, so for every value of mu, it can be a function of time um, or, and any of the three coordinates, right? so x, y, and z. Generally, I'm going to call this x0, x1, x2, and x3. So actually, I'm going to call this whole thing x mu. So it's four goes, right? And so mu just labels the four, it labels time, it labels my three coordinates. Okay, so obviously this is a field theory. I mean, you know, much like what we discussed. So everything is, you know, instead of having just, you know, X and Z, it has, it has um, Y and Z as well. Okay, so, so that's, you know, Maxwell's theory can be written, can be described in terms of, of these, these objects. Um, and the way uh, you, you sort of relate it to the things that you're perhaps more familiar with are, is through the field strength, right? So the field strength is sort of the object that uh, you, you build out of your magnetic fields and your electric fields, right? So, so I can compute, so if I'm given, given an A, I can commute what I, compute what I'm going to call F mu mu. So this thing here is I take the derivative, so I take A uh, and I take the derivative with respect to one of my x's, right? So again, mu labels time, you know, or any one of my coordinates. So this means taking the derivative of this with respect to one of my coordinates. And then if, say, mu is the, the time component, so let's say it's, it's phi, so, and, then I, and I take the derivative with respect to like x, then I, I do the other order, right? So 
<coughs> I take the uh, time derivative of, um, of the x component of, of my vector tension. So I, I form this thing. So this is, this is called the field strength. And, and you can kind of think of it as a matrix, right? There's two indices. You can think of it as row and column. Um, and it really is uh, the um, uh, electric and magnetic fields. I always get these wrong. Minus P3, P2, minus P1, 0, 0, P1, minus P2, uh, P3. So, so that's what this thing is. It really is just, you know, you can think of, the, so here, this is, so zero, zero is just zero. Actually, all the diagonals are going to be zero because it's anti-symmetric. Um, and then, you know, if I have, if I take the time derivative of the, sorry, if I take the, um, you know, the x derivative of zero, you know, I get my electric field, right? So the Laplace of my scalar potential is my electric field, and so on, right? I have my magnetic field. Okay, good. So, so this is the, the this is my um, uh, my field strength, and actually, there's, there's two things that I want to mention. <clears throat> One is that this thing here uh, satisfies the following equation. So, if I take if I take this thing and I take uh, derivatives of it, and this this means that this is the so-called summation convention, which Many of you have seen, and some of you may not have, but essentially this means taking the time derivative of the time component, the x derivative of the x component, the y component of the y component, the z component, derivative of the z component, and adding them all together, um, but sticking a minus sign in the time, the, the, the Renson variance, and, and I get this equation. Okay, so again, you know, strictly speaking, I'm starting to use kind of compressed notation, but this thing is just taking derivatives of this field strength. And these are my Maxwell equations. You can, you can sort of plug things in, and like this, plug them in, expand it out, and you will actually get the sort of standard Maxwell equations that you've seen a million times. Okay, so, so that's, this actually is the Maxwell equations with no charges, no sources. So here I have no, um, no charge particles and no currents. Okay. So, it's the vacuum Maxwell equations. Good. So that's that's that, this is this is physics. This bit is sort of physics. There's no way of sort of getting that sort of from mathematical consistency. It's physics. Um, but the the next equation this one is the, the so-called Bianchi identity. And this one is just um, is, is just a property of what this thing means. So here I've defined, and actually, sorry, I guess I wanted to do this. So I want to define star f. This is the dual of f, so the so-called Hodge dual. Um, so f uh, mu nu um, is, so I guess it is by using the totally anti-symmetric tensor, so the so-called levi civita tensor, rho sigma, rho sigma. So this thing here, has, again, so mu can be zero, one, two, three, and this is anti-symmetric in all of its indices. And I take these indices and I sort of contract them um, by summing over them, sort of like I described, and that gives me some other object. Oh, I've messed up my indices. Um, that uh, gives me, so you can see the sort of the indices match up. And, and again, this thing actually, you know, so it has two indices and you can, you can actually, um, uh, it's just another two by two matrix, and essentially it's, it's minus b1, 2, b3, b1, b2, b3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 uh, b3, b2, b1, b1, b2, minus b3. So it really is just sort of, it, it's just a reorganization of the e's and the b's, um, and you can actually check that if you take this um, and take the derivative in this way, it's automatically zero. It doesn't follow from sort of any physics. It just follows from this definition um, and anti-symmetry. So th this is sort of always true. Okay? So, and as I say, this is called Bianchi identity, and this is called the, the dual of yeah, the dual field strength. Okay. Good. So I need one more thing about what Maxwell theory is. And that is sort of, 
in some sense, the central idea of Maxwell theory. So this was sort of pointed out by Weil in the early 20th century, and Schrodinger was very impressed with it and, and sort of you know, generalized it a lot. And it's the following, the following statement. These equations have a symmetry in them. So if I take a mu, which as I say is a function of x mu, and I change it, I add something to it, And so I add some arbitrary function, lambda, which again is some arbitrary function of my coordinates, time, and x, y, z, and I take the derivative of it. This, this thing here, if I take this and I use, if I use this to sort of do my theory, I will get exactly the same answers. Nothing changes. The physics doesn't care about, about this quantity. In fact, you can kind of see that if I take this and I stick it into this, it, I'll get the same f. This bit will actually drop out. And so in this case, actually, f is invariant under this change. And of course, you know, the Maxwell equation is written in terms of f. So if f doesn't care about this bit, then the equations don't care about it, and physics is the same. OK, so this is called gauge symmetry. Um, and again, I'm sure nearly all of you have heard of it or seen it. Um, you can also ask, so here, I haven't been talking about like charged particles, but say I did have like some you know, like electrons, right? A charged particle. Um, and say I describe the electrons by also by a field, so they say the probability of finding an electron at some at some point. So this this field here describes my electron. Under a gauge transformation, it will transform in the following way. Like this. Okay. So E is the charge of my electron, and it, it sort of gets multiplied by this complex number, or this complex, yeah. And, and this, this object here, this, is, this can be thought of as an element of a group. So I can take two of these things. Of course, you can multiply them together, and you, get, you also get back a phase, right? So it's the usual thing. So these, these objects, I can multiply them. There's the identity. I can make an inverse by you know, sticking a minus sign in front of it. These are unitary. This is the U1 group, right? It's the group of, uh, oh, um, yeah, so this is the U1 group. Uh, if I, in particular, if I take, say I take the conjugate of this quantity, I guess it's inverse, right? So that's why it's the unitary group. So if I think of this thing, so if I call this, say I call this U, so here, if I take the complex conjugate, or which I'm going to call U dagger, this is U inverse. And so if I multiply this by this, I get one, right? Um, okay, so as I say, this is the, the group U1. So that was, that's, that's Maxwell's theory. And then in the 1950s, uh, people were doing, uh, you know, uh, what do you call, it? studying nuclear structure, right? So there's lots of experiments, and people were looking at that nuclear structure, and they noticed that there is a symmetry, right? That, the, that, that all the experiments seem to show that there was, um, so I have protons and I have neutrons, you know, doing various different experiments with these things, scattering them, blah blah blah, and they noticed that if I if I sort of if I interchange these things, the physics is essentially the same. There's a slight bit that's not, but basically it's the same. And in fact, it's not just interchange them, but really I can make a sort of a a change of the you know. You know, so I'm going to call, so we call this thing U. This is my new U, right? So I, but I can make a two by two matrix chain. So I can make arbitrary combinations of these things um, with sort of four parameters. And it's not really four though. So, because this U has to be of a special type. So U dagger has to be equal to U inverse. So if I take the transpose and I take the complex conjugate, I got to get the inverse matrix. And, and, and determinant of U has to be of equal to, to one. But, but more than that, these can actually be complex numbers. So here, uh, B, B, B are elements of, of the complex numbers. And so this, this here is SU2. This is the group of two by two unitary uh, determinant one matrices. And so they, they noticed that there was this, this symmetry. And that seemed important. Um, so uh, lots of people start trying to, to think about it. Um, and in particular, um, uh, C.N. Yang, also called, I guess, Frank Yang. It's, common, it, it's still common today, actually, uh, but it definitely was common where people from China 
and they would come to the US. So he was a PhD student in University of Chicago. They either choose or have an English name because they get tired of people mispronouncing their name um, or whatever, I don't know. So anyway, so yeah, so Xi'an Yang, uh, also Frank Yang, um, was a graduate student, as they say, at University of Chicago in 1947. And around then, 1947, 1949, he was thinking about this. And in particular, he was like, I should be able to do Maxwell's theory, but with this, the symmetry group, right? Like here I have U1, that's a group. Here I have SU2, it's a group. It's got to be the right theory of, you know, nuclear physics. Okay, didn't work, couldn't, couldn't get it to work, but in uh, 53, after he had his PhD, he was visiting Brookhaven uh, in the US. He spent his entire, I think his entire career in the US. Um, and he had an office mate, uh, uh, Robert Mills. And so uh, they, and, and this is again, one of these marvelous things about sort of how science works, right? They were in the same office. They talked about things. They talked about the experiments that were happening. They talked about crazy ideas that they had for how to do additional physics. So Yang told Mills about this idea for generalizing uh, Maxwell's theory. And they worked on it um, and, um, and they found a generalization, which is called the Yang Mills theory. And so this generalization uh, is, is, is the following. So again, I'll be somewhat sketchy, but. Um, yeah. So I take, I take my gauge field, A mu, again, four components, but I make it uh, four matrices. So, so here I'm going to sum over i is equal to 1 to 3. These sigmas are my Pauli matrices, which you've probably seen before. So sigma 1 is uh, 0, 1, 1, 0. Sigma 2 is 0 minus i, i, 0. And then sigma 3 is uh, 1 minus 1, 0, 0. Okay, so these are, these are 2 by 2 matrices. And so I sum three 2 by 2 matrices with coefficients given by these a's. Um, and, and this is my new gauge potential, right? But now it's, it's a matrix value. So that's, that's the big thing. And, and of course, these are SU2. These are the algebra of SU2. But this was, this was sort of, well, in some sense, actually, this was kind of the trivial idea, right? That was, okay, I want the gauge theory that is SU2. The non-trivial thing was, what is the generalization of the field strength, right? I wrote down for you what the field strength in the, um, uh, in Maxwell was, and this was the answer. So it's the same as Maxwell's theory, but you add an extra term that is the commutator. So again, this is the product of two matrices, and then you take, you know, the other order because now the order matters, and I add that that commutator to my field strength. This, first of all, it's nonlinear. Again, you can see the theory was linear. Now it's nonlinear. That just makes everything so, so, so much more complicated. Um, even though it seems like a small thing, but it really is everything. Um, but, you know, in, in another way, it's kind of the most simple thing you could do, right? Like if you were going to add something to it, what could you add? And uh, but this, is, this is it. The, uh, the Maxwell equation, uh, the, so yeah, the generalization of the Maxwell equation is the following. Okay. Again, so I have this, this is called the covariant derivative, and it's the usual derivative plus an extra term that has this commutator in it, and I set this to zero. This is the Yang-Mills equation. It's also true that this is also true. This is the Bianchi identity. And this one, this one again is, is there's no. This is physics. This one is just the fact that this is defined this way. 
So if I stick this thing in here and here, it's automatically zero. You have to work a little bit harder. You have to use the Jacobi identity, blah, blah, blah. But it's, again, sort of, it just follows from the definition. So, so this was, this was the, this was the, um, this was there. This is, a, like, as I say, it's a very, very profound generalization of Maxwell theory. Um, it has an enormous amount of beautiful mathematical structure. There's a lot of geometry, huge amount of 20th century uh, geometry and mathematic, mathematical physics has studied this equation, um, even to this day. And, um, and it's the wrong theory of, of, of pions. Um, and uh, you can kind of see why almost immediately in that, like, the Maxwell's theory has, like, electromagnetic waves or photons, and they're massless particles. Now, they don't have any mass. This doesn't have any mass. But it has extra, these are massless particles as well. And people had done nuclear physics and they hadn't seen any extra massless particles. They, there was, they'd seen pions, but pions are light, but they've got mass. And so Yang was actually invited to, uh, um, to the Institute for Advanced Studies in 1954. And uh, this, this, this sort of generalization had been studied by a number of different people, including uh, Wolfgang Pauli. Pauli had actually come up with it in a sort of a very crazy different way by looking at six-dimensional gravity, dimensionally reducing, and coming up with this. It was this sort of idea of trying to find unified theory. But he noticed that this, this, this extra massless particle was there. And so I don't know whether this is true, but there's like a, there's an article by Misha Schiffman who says that Pauli saw this and he discarded it because he already introduced one hypothetical massless particle, that was neutrino. He, conjectured the existence of the neutrino, and he didn't have the nerve to sort of introduce another one. <laughs> he was also visiting Princeton when Yang came to give his talk, and in his, in, in, you know, so Yang wrote down, not, not actually this equation, but essentially sort of one very similar, and Pauli went, what's the mass of that? Um, and Yang said, oh, it's very complicated, um, uh, you know, and, and so he tries to go on. Pauli goes, no, what's the mass of that? He goes, well, we've looked into it, but we can't really um, you know, but it's complicated. And Pali went, that's no excuse. What's the mass of that? And so Yang just sat down <laughs> and refused to talk. <laughs> um, and so then eventually Oppenheimer was like, well, maybe we should just let Frank continue his talk. Uh, and Pali had to show up. So that was, that was, uh, yeah. I, I'm not suggesting this is a method for when you get harassed by speakers, um, but, but I guess it, it worked in this sense. Uh, okay, so. So that was that was this. The thing is, though, is that the criticism about the mass is absolutely true. <laughs> you know, so so it, it didn't actually get an awful lot of attention for for a while. But this is another kind of sort of the opposite way, or the other way of doing physics or doing science, where you come up with a beautiful theory that does not fit uh, nature at all, and then just because it's such a beautiful idea, it has to be used somewhere, and you just wait. Um, <laughs> and, and indeed, again, not necessarily always a good a good approach, but it did work in this case because there was not only one solution to this massless problem, but two solutions. Um, so the the two solutions are. Um, so the first is, so this isn't a good theory of, of pions and nucleons, right? Um, but it is the correct theory of the strong force. Um, and so the first solution is asymptotic freedom. And so quarks and gluons, which make up uh, protons and neutrons, um, are described by an SU3 gauge theory. So not SU2, there's, there's three uh, colors, red, green, and blue, um, right? Uh, so there's, there's three colors in, 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 in quantum chromodynamics, and um, the, the proper gauge theory is not SU2, it's SU3. And what happens in this case is that the theory at low energies is very, very strongly interacting. So these gluons can never, you never see them sort of uh, far away. So that, that was basically why you don't, they, they are massless, but you never see them because they're sort of stuck um, sort of inside the nucleon. So that was, that's asymptotic freedom. Now, in fairness, this, so th this obviously is the quantum theory, so you have to quantize this theory. And, and we know that this is the right theory of the strong force. There's just a huge amount of um, uh, numerical and experimental evidence uh, in favor of it. However, it is still true that we really don't mathematically understand how the mass arises in the quantum theory. This is the so-called uh, mass gap problem. And I think you know, still you win a million dollars if you can uh, show how the mass arises in, in, in Yang. So we know the answer, but actually there's a lot to be 
you know, still, still <coughs> understood. The second one is that the electroweak theory, which describes things like the neutrino and um, all that, um, the, the gauge group in that case is SU2 times U1. And in this case, the, 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 these, these vectors, these A's, the, the vector bosons, are given a mass by the Higgs mechanism. To this one the symmetry breaking, and um, that's that's how they get mass. So, so in this case, you know, the, like the theory was was in, in some sense sufficiently beautiful that it had to be true, um, and it just required waiting for a while. Okay. So the last thing that I want to say is is this bit. Um, I'm probably yeah. Maybe just about, uh, I just need like maybe five minutes. Um, so how do we get integrable models from Yang? So obviously these two things seem Wildly different. I mean, um, so how how are how are they connected? Okay. So one thing that we can do is if I can look for special solutions, right? So not not the general, not the full theory, right? But I'm going to look at fields that. Satisfy uh, that are like are this time, but satisfy this so that the field is equal to its dual, right? So this is a very strong restriction. Obviously, generally speaking, this would not be true, but I can say, okay, what happens if I also impose this? And you can actually see that this will guarantee this equation right? because I take this equation, I use that one, which gives me this, and this, as I say, has to be zero. This is, there's no physics in this one. So, so this, so self-dual Yang-Mills implies Yang-Mills, but not the other way around, right? There are solutions to this that are not of this form. Okay, so this is, this is sort of the restriction, um, and this is what I mean by this self-dual Yang-Mills thing. Um, and what I can do is I can look at reductions. So I want to look at symmetry reductions of of this theory. But what do I mean by a reduction? I mean, I take, I, I assume that there's an asymmetry. So for example, I can say I assume that the theory does not depend on time. So I can say, so we can assume that A is time translation invariant. So that means that sort of d0 of a mu is equal to 0. Right? So that would be a time translation symmetry. And actually, if I impose this one, this equation um, becomes the so-called Boglomoni equation, which is interesting for magnetic monopoles. But given, given the time, I want to assume maybe a little bit more. Let's assume that a is a translation invariant in uh, the y and z direction. So d2a is equal to d3a is equal to 0, right? So none of these things uh, depend on uh, y or z. That's another thing. Right? And that's what I, I can also, I can, you know, here I said that this thing is a theory of 2 by 2 unitary matrices. But we've also seen I can make it SU3, which would be 3 by 3 matrices. I can make it matrices of this. I can consider other gauge groups. In fact, one that I want to consider is the so-called SL2C. So this is two by two matrices that are complex that have determinant one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a guess for this equation, for a solution to this equation. So I'm going to write down, so A0 is 1 quarter dx phi 0 0 minus 1 quarter <coughs> dx phi. I'm going to say a1. So, and here phi is some field, but it only depends on x and t, right? So I've assumed that nothing depends on y. So a1 is also diagonal. Okay. So I have, I say, I'm going to make a guess for solution of those two. And I also need to write down A2 and A3. Mm. 
These ones are also quite simple. So I make this, this guess, and then I ask, is this equation satisfied? And you find that this equation is only satisfied if um, this equation is satisfied. So this equation is the sine Gordon theory, which I mentioned but didn't write down. So this is another example of an integrable model. Um, and so we can see that this, this sort of, this guess here, gives me this model. Um, I can write down another one. Uh, so this is how it is like. One, no. One, two, three. This one's also slightly complicated. So I can take this guess. This one, you can probably see, you know, uh, sorry, and also again, sorry, uh, reduce on x2 and x3. So nothing depends on these, so it's symmetry invariant. And I take these, and then the self dual Yang Mills gives me KD. And you can keep doing this. You can, you can sort of, you know, take. Take a different gauge group, take a different symmetry, ask what the self dual Yang Mills equation give you, and you'll get another integral model, and another integral model. And in fact, the claim is, is that you get all integrable models, although that's probably not true. Um, but you do, you do get a lot of them. And you do, you, you kind of get them all, um, but you sometimes have to work a little bit hard. So, finally, so in 1985, there's sort of a proposal by Ward, who's a English mathematician, he actually, I guess, was here in Trinity briefly, um, prior to this, though, I think, in the 70s. Um, and so his claim, many, all integrable models, can be found as productions And so in this sense, self dual Yang Mills is a theory of all things integrable. The problem is, is that I actually haven't told you what integrable models are. And so it's like, what are all integrable models? I would need some other definition of what an integrable model is. You could say it's something that I find through self dual Yang Mills, but that's obviously sort of, uh, you know, um, being, being a little bit cheeky. So, the thing, so the, so this one point is that there really is like this this huge zoo of theories, right? And they actually all are somehow live inside uh, this one in in various different ways. And so there really is sort of a real unity to all these things. And and the special properties of this theory um, uh, sort of kind of explain many of the special properties of all of these integral models. Um, one really interesting question is, what does it actually mean? And, you know, in order to answer this, you'd have to say what an integral model means. And, and that, that actually is sort of an interesting thing. Is there some other mathematical way of sort of characterizing what, an, what integrability uh, means? Um, and then just one final thing is that, you know, obviously this, as I say, is sort of a mathematical kind of thing. Um, but the self-dual Yang Mills actually, because Yang Mills, of course, as I say, did prove to be the correct theory of, of nature, right, of, of strong force. And self-dual Yang Mills actually does play quite a sort of a nice, important role. So, for example, let's say Yang Mills, we know it's the right theory because at high energies, um, you know, it has this asymptotic freedom, which means it sort of is, is weakly coupled. But for low energy physics, it's, it's non, you know, you can't use perturbative methods. It's non-perturbative. You need to have non-perturbative physics to understand it. 
One of the important things in that case is things like instantons, right? So instantons are sort of related to the non-perturbative sector of Yang Mills. And actually, you can understand uh, the instantons because they are solutions to self-dual Yang Mills. And in fact, this, this connection between integral models and self-dual Yang Mills connects with things like uh, twister theory and the so-called Penrose and Ward transforms, which give you sort of this, again, this kind of, it's like a, a version of this inverse scattering method, this sort of nonlinear transformation, but allows you to find this, these non-perturbative solutions that are important in understanding uh, the non-perturbative nature of Young Mills. Um, and uh, so in, in that case, actually, even though this can be sort of somewhat uh, artificial, it really does have uh, kind of important uh, practical uses as well as the role it plays in understanding all these things. Okay, great. Thank you. I'd just like to thank everyone for coming and as a thank you to Tristan for giving the oh, talk. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, high five. <laughs>